Hey everyone, welcome to our luncheon. We'll give it one more minute to let everyone filter in and then we'll get started with our programming today. All right, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our, our virtual YMWREA luncheon. Uh, take your seats so we can get started. Uh, I'm Laura Jackson, the chairman of YMWREA for 2020. Uh, it wouldn't be a YMWREA luncheon without having the board sitting on the dais, so everyone's here with you, uh, watching you eat your lunch, as we always do. Uh, so let's do some quick introductions. Caroline, you want to start? Hi, sure. I'm Caroline Merck. I work at CBRE doing office leasing. Um, I'm the vice chairman for YMWREA this year. Hi, I'm Alex Caskell. Hope everyone's doing okay and staying safe. I work at ABS Partners Real Estate and I'm this year's director of PR and social media. Alan? Hey everyone, I'm Alan Bernstein, Senior Vice President at Waterman Interest, focused on acquisitions and leasing. I'm maintaining the website this year. Hope you all have been enjoying our Zoom content. If you have any comments or feedback on that, please let me know. We're always trying to do better. I wish you all the best and stay healthy and safe. Great, James. Hi everyone, James Nelson, hope you're doing okay. Um, I head up investment sales at Avis and Young and I am the education chair here for YMWREA. Lauren? Hi everyone, I'm Lauren Calandrillo. I work in office leasing at JRT Realty Group and I do membership this year on the board. Ryan. Hey everyone, I'm Ryan Lee. I'm the first vice president on the investment team at RxR and I'm the secretary on the board of YMW this year. And Forrest. Hi everyone, I'm Forrest Moss at North River Company. Hope everyone's staying safe and healthy. I am this year's treasurer. Great, thanks everyone. Uh, so to begin our luncheon, we'd like to call upon Paul Massey, founding partner of B6 Real Estate Advisors, to give today's invocation. Please welcome Paul. Thank you, Laura. Um, it is great to be here connected with uh, so many friends. Back at another time of national crisis, our then president, Abe Lincoln, wrestled with uh, devastating losses and and all kinds of turmoil relating to the ongoing war, he had to replace more than half a dozen generals uh, before he settled in with General Grant. Um, the difficult thing for President Lincoln was he was a man of great values. And one of those values was a complete inability to criticize or complain. So legend has it that he would write these scathing letters to his generals um, and then never mail them, stuff them in his desk, and his desk was filled with these letters. Our guest speaker today, Bob Knackle, is a guy who has those kind of values, the same values that are espoused by your board of governors here and, the, uh, and all the members of YMWREA. Uh, another legend has it that Bob Knackle has a desk filled with letters addressed to me as I struggled occasionally with running the day-to-day -day operations of our former business. Mercifully for me, he never sent them. We, uh, we live at a time when those kind of values are gonna be necessary for our leadership. And um, here's to praying that our local and federal leadership will be people of great values, will try to do the right thing and do their best. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, that was great. Now we would like to recognize the former chairman in the Zoom room today. So rise when your name is called and then sit back down and imagine a stadium full of applause. Dennis Carr, Leslie Harwood, Nikki Hurriet, Mitty Lieberson, Mitch Arkin, Brian Waterman, David Brouse, Bill Montana, Rob Fink, Rob Shapiro, and Lenny Lazzarino. Okay, now we have a few reminders. So let's go to the board for a video update.
Sorry, I was really muted. Let me redo that. Meetings that we've been having. We're going to be doing more of those meetings in May and June and having our favorite bartender come on and teach us how to make a drink. But we can't just sit around drinking and hanging out. We need to do some workouts. Ryan, what do you have in store for us? Thanks, Laura. We have a few exciting fitness events coming up. Next Tuesday, we'll be holding a virtual core power yoga class on Zoom. And then the following Tuesday, we'll be hosting a workout class with Eric Rakowski, along with the special guest appearance from Victor Cruz, the former New York Giant player. All proceeds and donations for both events go to charity, and weights are completely optional for both classes. You'll just need a yoga mat, towel, and water to participate. What's up, Caroline? Thanks, Ryan. Our signature golf, tennis, and leisure event all by dinner reception will be hosted on Tuesday, October 6th at Fresh Meadows Country Club. Alex? As Caroline's co-chair of the summer now fall outing, we can't wait for the day where we can be all out on the golf course, tennis court, and all new games. Details are on their way. Lauren? Hi everyone. Applications for the spring class are due this Friday, May 15th at 5 p.m. Please reach out to me if you have any questions. Forrest, do I owe you some dues? Thanks, Lauren. Hope everyone's staying safe and healthy. Please don't forget to pay your 2020 dues. You can, you can pay directly on our website at ymwra.org. For those members experiencing financial hardship as a result of COVID-19, please reach out to me directly. Alan? Thanks, Forrest. Hey, everyone. Please check our website for all of our upcoming events and to view all of our exclusive Zoom content. Our June luncheon will be featuring Helena Durst and Tom Bowe from the Durst Organization. You can submit any questions you have in RSVPing to me or Ryan Lee. James? Thanks, Alan. Even though we can't mentor in person, we can still do so virtually. We've had over 15 applicants apply to be mentored from our various graduate programs we partner with. If you'd be interested in mentoring them, please email me at james.nelson at avisonyoung.com. Back to you, Laura. Thanks, James. All right, awesome. All right, so now silence your dogs, your cell phones, and any other background noise that you have uh, for today's speaker, Bob Knackle. During Bob's presentation, you can enter any questions that you have in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And here's an introduction for Bob. Bob is the chairman of investment sales with JLL Capital Markets in New York. In his role, Bob leads the investment sales division focusing on expanding middle market asset sales in the greater New York region while driving expansion across the firm's institutional business. Bob was chairman and founding partner of Massey Knackle Realty Services, New York's number one building sales firm. He started his career in 1984 at CBRE where he met Paul Massey. They both left CB in 1988 to form Massey Knackle. From 1988 through 2014, Massey Nackel closed over 6,000 transactions with an aggregate value in excess of 23 billion. On December 31st, 2014, Cushman and Wakefield acquired Massey Nackel. At Cushman, Bob acted as chairman of New York Investment Sales. He was ranked the top originating investment sales broker at Cushman in 2014, 15, and 16. Bob graduated from the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania with a bachelor's degree in economics. He's a two-time winner of Rebney's Robert T. Lawrence Most Ingenious Deal of the Year Award. Please join me in welcoming Bob Knackle. Thanks, Laura. Uh, thank you for that introduction. And, and Paul, thank you for your, uh, your kind words. I do have uh, those thousands of letters uh, tucked in a suitcase uh, up in the attic. I'll break out someday. But um, <laughs> seriously, uh, I never would have had an occasion to write a letter, I think, in the uh, in the 26 years and 46 days that Paul and I ran MK, we only had one argument. And uh, fortunately, he won that one. And that, uh, that one served us very well. And that's uh, another conversation for another day. But uh, no, it was, a, it was a great partnership. And uh, I want to thank you for, for having me today and try to share some uh, lessons learned in those 26 years and 46 days of, of running a brokerage business. And, you know, I was asked to, to put these lessons together many years ago. Um, and first time I did it, I thought it was just relative to a brokerage business. But many of the lessons actually apply very broadly to other service businesses uh, and other businesses in general. So I hope you get something out of it. 
and uh, please ask as many questions as you like. I'd like this to be uh, very interactive, but uh, I'll kind of start with uh, my own story, uh, which was getting into the real estate business completely by accident. Uh, I'll take you back to 1981, uh, spring break. I'm a freshman at Wharton, wanted to get into investment banking like every other Wharton kid. Uh, and so I drove around Northern Jersey where I grew up, dropping my resume off at every commercial bank and investment bank I saw. Uh, I was in Hackensack and came out of a Payne Weber office across the hall. I see Coldwell Banker. I think the place is a bank. So I go in, drop my resume off. Later that day, they call me, hey, we'd like to interview you tomorrow for a summer job. Um, I set up the interview. Uh, again, this is 1981, there's no internet, so I go to the library to look up this bank. I see it's a real estate company. I'm like, oh crap, I don't wanna get into real estate. But they were the only ones who were hiring college kids for the summer, took the job, loved it from day one, uh, and then started with CB uh, in New York after I got out of school. So lesson number one, is uh, keep an open mind and think outside the box because sometimes opportunity is not what it appears to be. Uh, so you have to have a little bit of dexterity with your, your mindset. So, um, I, so I get to CB, uh, meet Paul, and I'll never forget my first day going to the office. There's about 60 guys leasing office space, guys and gals. Uh, and there's uh, about 20 people who were renting stores, and there were four people in the investment sales group, uh, Paul being one of them, who had just finished a one-year training program uh, with the company, uh, and three other brokers that had about 20 years of experience. And so I get in the first day, the boss says, hey, Massey just started in sales recently, follow him around, he'll show you where the coffee machine is, and that kind of thing. Um, and it was very clear that um, that the, the guys with 20 years of experience weren't going to spend a lot of time with us. So literally day two on the job, we were having lunch together and we're like, hey, why don't we just partner up, split everything 50-50 and see how it goes. Uh, and that was basically the start of a 30-year partnership. Um, and um, I, I think the, the biggest lesson um, regarding partnerships and partners um, is that I, I think if you, the reason why, why my partnership with Paul I think was so successful is that our work ethic is almost identical. I remember back in the early days, um, we would compete to see who could get into the office earlier and we would generally in sometime between 6.15 and 6.30 and we were always in within a couple of minutes of each other. And I, I bet that if you add up all the hours over our entire careers of how many hours we've worked, I bet you the difference in hours is less than 10 hours if you aggregated all the time we spent working. And I think that really is, is the lesson in picking your partners. I think for a partnership to be successful, you have to have the same work ethic. Whether you have similar skill sets or different skill sets or complementary skill sets, uh, if you both don't have the same work ethic, I don't see partnerships working out. Uh, and I think that was one of the keys to why uh, it, it was such a, a great partnership for us over all those years. So we, uh, we decide uh, in actually 1986, uh, we was our second year at the company, we were, we were the top salespeople at CB. Uh, so we were like, oh, we, we're, we should leave, go start our own business. There were a number of reasons for that. Um, mainly the, the company was not uh, living up to the, um, the, the territory system that we had. And so we felt that, you know, maybe it was time to go start our own place. Um, we go down to, um, to Chemical Bank at the time. And we said to our banker, I remember Nancy Stockwell, she was the branch manager at, uh, what was it Paul, 383 Madison, I think was the chemical headquarters. And uh, said, Nancy, uh, you know, we're hot shots. We need half a million dollars. Where do we sign? And of course she laughed at us and said, hey, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Go start your business. Come back after you have a three year track record. Maybe we'll talk about giving you a revolving credit line or something like that. So. Uh, we were dejected, walked back to the office, 
Um, and so another lesson is if you're going to start a business, don't expect bank financing for a while because uh, banks want to see a track record uh, before you, uh, before you uh, can get any kind of loan or financing. Um, so we, uh, for the next two years, uh, Paul and I um, took money out of every commission. And I remember for, for years, Paul and I had breakfast and lunch together uh, every day. And I remember Paul whipping out his cross pen and on the back of a napkin writing down all the deals we had on the contract, how much the commissions were going to be, how much we were going to take out of each deal. And after a couple of years, we saved up enough. Uh, and left CB in, um, in 1988, November 15th of 88, to start MK. Um, and uh, so we, we start in 88, and it was actually fortuitous that we didn't start the business in 1986, because in 1988, um, we were, um, you know, 1988, even though the stock market crashed in October of 87, 1988 was still a good year in the real estate market. It really was 1989 when volume started to go down and then uh, the SNL crisis kicked in and uh, things in the very early 90s were really tough. Um, and so when we were going through tough times, when that volume fell off the table, um, our overhead was only $15,000 a month. Uh, had we started the business in 86, it probably would have been 25 or 30,000 a month, and that would have really hurt us. So we'll fast forward to 1990. I think we sold two or three buildings only in 1990, and um, we had our $15,000 a month burn rate, and we find ourselves in a position where we have $15,000 left in the bank. Uh, we have no deals under contract. And we look at each other, and at the time, I think we had three or four other employees. So um, at the time, my apartment was a few blocks from the office. So we went to my apartment and said, okay, what do we do? Do we pay all the bills next month and hope something good happens? Do we pay $5,000 a month in overhead to keep the lights on, pay the most important things? Uh, we did think for a nanosecond of going to Atlantic City and putting it all on black. Um, and uh, what we realized was that, hey, you know what? We have really good credit. So we went around to every, every bank in town and we got a $2,000 credit card here and a $4,000 credit card there. And between both of us, we came up with $60,000 in credit cards. And for most of 1990 and early 1991, we ran Massinacle on credit cards. Um, then we get to 91, the market still had not recovered. And uh, so that the, a lesson out of that is always maintain good credit because you never know when you're going to need, need credit. Um, but so we're in 1991 and we're at a, another point where, uh, we have the, uh, $60,000 in credit card lines maxed out. Uh, things are not looking good. And this was kind of a, an early iteration of Shark Tank. So Paul and I go to one of our clients, a very, very wealthy guy. He was in the Forbes 400. And he was an older guy, really liked us. So we go into his office and we say, look, we, you know, we have this business. We love the business. You've been a good client of ours. We need a $75,000 loan. Would you consider giving it to us? And I remember he put his, his hand on his chin. He said, you know what? Really like you boys. I tell you what, I'll give you the 75,000, but I want 50% of the stock in the business. And we, of course, you know, our chins hit our chest and we, we say, thank you very much for the offer. Let us think about it. Um, so depressed to go back to the office. And then it occurred to Paul that his stepfather-in-law, Jack Holler, uh, was a mortgage broker in New Jersey. And maybe Jack could give us the 75,000 and we'd offer him 25% of the stock in the business. So um, Paul has this conversation with Jack and Jack in an unbelievable gesture says, you know what guys, I'm gonna give you the 75,000, but I'm not, I don't want the stock. Someday you're gonna be very successful and you're gonna feel bad you gave me the stock, so I don't want the stock. And uh, that was just uh, an unbelievable thing on his part. And so, 
uh, we'll always be forever grateful for Jack, what he did. In fact, our salesman of the salesperson of the year award uh, was named after Jack and we gave that out uh, for many, many years and always, uh, always think of Jack uh, very, very fondly. Um, so when we started the business, one of the things that we did is we came up with this territory system and that was based on, you know, we had one senior broker working in each neighborhood. And the thought behind that was that we really understood what business we were in. We did not think that we were in the real estate brokerage business. We thought we were in the information business. And in Manhattan, there's 27,649 buildings south of 96th Street. Um, in the four boroughs, not including Staten Island, there's about 165,000 investment properties. There's no way that any one broker can know everything about all those properties. So we came up with this territory system and the basis for the way we organized the, the company was the realization that it was an information business, not a real estate business. And you had to have information that had a tremendous amount of integrity. And if we had brokers who were focused on one specific area, they would get to know that area better than anybody. They would know who was buying, who was selling, what new developments were going on in the area, what zoning changes might affect value, what major tenants were moving in. Um, and so the realization of, of the fact that we were in the information business was a very, very big thing for us. So um, another lesson is understanding what your business really is. And another lesson was having a game plan. So we were very analytic about the way we approached the business. Within each territory, we sized the territories based on production that we thought was possible, based on a certain market share that could be obtained, what the historical turnover of sales were in a particular area. So somebody who was big enough so somebody could make a really good living, but small enough that you really could have a great grasp on all of the information and, and what was happening there. Um, and we told each of our brokers, we want you to speak to every owner, at least every three months, so four times a year, we want you to send a piece of mail. Again, when we started out, no email. Um, so send a piece of mail to each of your, um, the folks who own in your territory once a month and be on top of mind. Get to build relationships with these people and constantly work that list. And that's really sales 101. If you, if you were going to uh, Iceland and you were gonna be a rock broker, what would you do? You'd make up a list of the people who own rocks. You'd make up a list of the people who buy rocks. And you would try to get the people who own the rocks to hire you to sell the rocks and to the people who, you know, buy the rocks. It's very, very simple and basic. So, um, you know, we, we had a game plan for how to set up the business, how to attack the market, how to uh, build relationships. And it was relatively formulaic. Um, but uh, we, you have to have a game plan. Come up with goals, set goals, um, prioritize your goals, meet your objectives, uh, and have a plan. Um, another lesson learned was something that we didn't learn. Um, and we, well, we eventually learned it, but initially we didn't, we weren't aware of it uh, and didn't know to do it. Uh, and that was one of the thousands of mistakes that we made uh, over the years. But it was not asking senior people for advice. Um, a lesson is there are a lot of people who have been there and done that. A lot of folks like to share their knowledge with people. So simply ask them. If you're a young person in the business, find some people that you're friendly with that are more senior in the business. Take them to lunch. Take them for a drink. Uh, do a video conference and ask them questions about how they overcame certain things at certain points in time. I think you'll be surprised how much people will share with you. Um, you know, later in the course of the company, uh, we discovered that that was a, a great way to get knowledge and we formed an advisory board uh, with some people that really, really were tremendously helpful to us um, that shared some great information. Um, you know, and these were folks who are icons in the business, people like Steve Siegel um, from CBRE and, uh, um, John Fowler from HFF, um, you know, people who in our business we, we really looked up to, a number of other great people. I don't mean to leave anybody out, but, um, you know, ask senior people for advice. You'll be surprised what you can learn. And if 
if a conversation can help you avoid making a couple of mistakes, that will save you a tremendous amount of time. And time is probably one of the most precious assets that we have. I always say in this business, you have your knowledge and you have your time. Um, you don't want to waste time. You can always increase the knowledge that you have. You can't get more time. You can only use it more effectively. Um, another lesson learned was that your reputation in a service business is everything. Um, we always tried to make sure that we looked at everything from the other person's perspective, uh, realize always do the right thing, even if nobody will know. Um, it's just a recognition that your reputation is, is one of your main assets. Uh, and you have to always remember that you don't want to do anything that could in any way negatively impact your reputation. Um, next couple of lessons go hand in hand. Uh, one, you need to differentiate yourself because uh, there are thousands of people trying to do exactly what you do. Uh, and that differentiation creates a competitive advantage. Best way to, to differentiate yourself is through specialization. You know, we always had the mantra uh, at MK that we only sell buildings, we only work on exclusives, um, you know, we only represent sellers. And that differentiated ourselves. And, you know, particularly in the early days when it was just Paul and I and a secretary, um, we were winning business from folks who had a lot more experience than us, but that was because they were selling properties all over the city. And we could go into an owner and say, look, yeah, we've only sold five properties, but two of them are on the block, one of them is next door, and two of them are, you know, within three blocks of here. We know this market better than anyone. Uh, and it really gave us a competitive advantage and it enabled us to differentiate ourselves. So think about how you can differentiate yourself from other people and what is your competitive advantage that you can um, that you can put into a value proposition when you're talking to a potential client. Um, there's the, Paul, I'm, I'm curious if you remember his name. Do you remember who was the, um, the highest ranking Navy officer who was held in captivity the longest during the Vietnam War. You remember? Um, yep, yep, yep. Um, the the um, begins with an M complex. Um, hmm. Very close, James. Do you remember? It's not Dick Marchenko, is it? Although I know there's <laughs> no. another story about him. <laughs> no. no, his name is Admiral James Stockdale. Stockdale. And it's the Stockdale principle, right? Stockdale yeah, principle, so, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And yeah. so Stockdale principle was, Stockdale was highest ranking uh, prisoner of war during the Vietnam War. And uh, the, the Stockdale principle says, confront brutal reality directly and don't, um, you know, don't fabricate things in your own mind. And one of the things he saw prisoners who were, were in the, the camp with him would say, oh, well, it's going to be Thanksgiving soon. Maybe we'll get out by Thanksgiving. And then they didn't get out by Thanksgiving and they got de dejected. Uh, and then they said, well, maybe we'll get out by Christmas. And then they didn't get out by Christmas and they got dejected. Um, and they said, maybe we'll get out by Valentine's Day. And they didn't get out. They were dejected. So he just said, look, I'm going to be here for the foreseeable future. I'm just going to deal with it. They're not going to let me out, maybe ever. I'm just going to hope that I get out, be positive, but I'm just looking at my reality. Uh, and that, particularly in tough times, and I'd say given what's going on with COVID and everything, these are certainly challenging times in our market. So, you know, face the brutal reality, come up with a plan to deal with it, and understand that you know, the market's not going to turn tomorrow. Nobody's going to flip a switch. You know, things are going to be back to normal. We're going to have to change and adapt the way we do things to deal with our present reality. So uh, use the Stockdale principle. Read about this guy. It's really fascinating to read about what, what he did and the way he, um, he did things. And that leads to another lesson, which is to have faith that you'll succeed. Have courage. You have to believe in yourself. I think you know, one of the things that really helped Paul and I during the, the downturn, downturns that we faced was always having the belief that, hey, one way or another, we're going to make it through. 
I mean, you could look, I, I mean, you know, my father, when I told him that I had about $30,000 in credit cards and was taking, <laughs> taking advances on those lines to run a business that wasn't doing very well, he thought I was nuts. My dad was a high school principal and used to getting a salary his whole life, and he thought I was nuts to take a commission job in the first place. Um, but when I told him I was taking advances on credit cards to run this, this popcorn stand of a business, he thought I was nuts. But Paul and I really believed that it was going to work out for us. Um, so we, uh, we felt very comfortable doing it. And uh, you have to have faith, you have to have courage. Um, another lesson that we learned over the years was that you have to delegate to other people. At the beginning, first few years of running our company, we did everything and we did it together. We interviewed people, we painted the office, we took out the trash. We basically were responsible for everything. And as soon as we started to, um, I remember when we hired our first transactional associate, which was somebody who was basically working on the execution of our deal, stuffing envelopes, showing buildings, doing things that were really, really important, but not things that a senior broker had to do. Um, things started to grow geometrically. Now we hired uh, a number of administrative people and everyone should have an admin person because if you don't have an admin, you are an admin. You should not be doing things other than the things that are most important or where you add the most value to what your objectives are. So I, I think that if I could go back and change anything about what we did, you know, we were always relatively conservative with the way we hired people and brought people on. I would have brought a little more help on a little sooner, and that would have led to the, the growth of our company. Um, next, be passionate about what you do. Uh, I think that that is probably the number one trait that we saw in people that, and continue to see in people that do really well in our business, you have to be passionate about it. You have to love it because there are going to be tough times in anything. There are going to be tough times, but the passion is what will bring you through those tough times. Um, and, you know, waking up and, you know, you can't wait to get out of bed because you want to go in and do your craft. So important. You won't feel like you have a job. You'll love it. And uh, if you really have the passion for it, it's, uh, it makes you successful. And I really believe that you can be financially successful in any business, whether it's commercial real estate, music, poetry, or what have you. If you're really passionate about it, it will give you the ability to work hard enough and get through the tough times so that you will rise to the top. So feel it. You, you don't have the passion for what you're doing. Maybe look at doing something else. I think you have to have passion to, uh, to, to do really well. Uh, also, another lesson. You have to have a long-term perspective on things. Um, never take shortcuts, never do things for today. Um, and I think that um, that ties into um, always keeping the client's interests um, as the primary objective. I think some of the, the best relationships that Paul and I had over the years were with people who we met with, told them what we thought their building was worth and said, you know what, you shouldn't sell it now. And here's why. And those people looked at us like we were nuts. Like, hey, you guys make money when you sell buildings. You're telling me not to sell? Why would you do that? And sure enough, whether it was two years later, five years later, or in one case, 17 years later, that client came back to us and said, hey, I really appreciated what you guys told me. And now my building's worth a lot more. And it would have been a mistake to sell it when, um, when I was thinking about it. So always have a long-term perspective. This, this business is certainly, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And that gets back to not taking shortcuts. But have a long-term perspective on the business. Um, another lesson, hard work is essential. I think to really succeed in commercial real estate, you have to work hard and you have to be lucky. Uh, I think the harder you work, the luckier you get. Uh, and we always used to joke around that uh, at MK, you only have to work half a day. We don't care whether it's the first 12 hours of the day or the second 12 hours of the day, but if you're not working 12 hours a day, 
uh, it's tough to be successful in this business. So work half a day, uh, got to work hard, and got to work smart also. Um, and making mistakes is okay. Um, as I said, we made thousands and thousands of mistakes, but we rarely made the same mistake twice. So it's good to push yourself, try things. If you make a mistake, learn from your mistake. Um, you know, and one of the, the great things that I, I love doing when I pitch business and I don't win the business, I always call the client a few weeks later and say, hey, why didn't, I, why didn't you hire me? Why did you go with James? You know, James, maybe he's younger, better looking, but still, why did, why did you pick James and not me? And I learn more from the failures than I do from the successes. So um, push yourself, make mistakes, but look into the mistakes and try to learn from them and do everything you can to not make those same mistakes again. Um, and the last two things uh, deal with um, you know, some personal habits. One, you have to realize that honesty and integrity are at the core of business success. Paul mentioned Abe Lincoln. He's known as Honest Abe. Um, always do the right thing. Always do the right thing. And even if nobody will know whether you did the right thing or the wrong thing, you'll know. Do the right thing. And in this day and age where there really is no privacy, where you're either videoed or recorded or whatever, very, very unlikely that anything is gonna stay a secret today. So even more reason why, you know, always do the right thing. Um, remember that any uh, audio message you leave for somebody, any text or email you send, pretend it's gonna be on the front page of the New York Times, there's really no secrets anymore, but, but live your life in a way that, that you're always doing the right thing. You never have to worry about that stuff. Uh, and then lastly, one of the things that I think is really um, overlooked uh, and should actually be taught in colleges uh, is likability. And I, I really believe that if you look at the aptitude scale or the capability scale within our industry, and uh, let's say somebody who doesn't know anything is a two or a three on the, on the capability scale, and there's somebody who's a 10, who knows every law, every um, aspect of the business, can calculate IRRs in their head, um, that person's a 10 on the aptitude scale. But if they are uh, somebody that's not likable, I believe that someone who's a seven or an eight, and you have to be a seven or an eight, you can't be a two or a three, but if you're a seven or an eight and you're likable, you're gonna win business over that person who's a 10 most of the time, the overwhelming majority of the time. And how are you, you do you become likable? Well, one, just be a, a nice person, be a good person, but also try to find common interest with the people that you're working with. This is something I always admired about Paul. Paul is probably the best one in the world I've ever seen at this, where he meets somebody and he'll ask them a series of questions about them. You know, where'd you grow up? Um, you know, what do you do when you're not uh, doing business? How many kids do you have? What, do you, what are your hobbies? And the reason that's so impactful and important is that I believe if you put any two people together in a room, and they talk to each other for a half hour, they probably could find something they have in common. They like NASCAR, they like sports, they like weaving, cooking, whatever it is. But if you can find something that, that you and the other person truly, really like, not in a bullshit way where you're just pretending to like something you don't like, but if you really connect and you really both are, are passionate about something, it it's, puts the relationship on a whole different course. Like, uh, I don't know if any of you know Arnold Gumowitz. I love Arnie. He's great. Uh, he's mostly a multifamily investor, but he owns a broad portfolio. Um, we found that we have the New York Knicks in common. And so the first 30 or 45 seconds of every conversation I have with him, we talk about how bad the Knicks think. Um, and so that's something that, you know, we, we bond over. So, um, you know, try to be likable. And the best way to be likable is to find a common interest with somebody. Um, and I think if, if you do those kind of things, 
you're you're greatly increasing the probability that that you'll be successful. So uh, happy to answer any uh, any questions that you have. Sure, we actually have a few questions in. Uh, one question is, what is your definition of success? Oh, well, I think that's different for everybody. And I, I don't think that me imparting a definition of success is really hard because my priorities are very different from everyone else's. I think that probably the most challenging thing in life is to find balance. And that's balance between your work schedule, your family, your friends, your health, your faith, your community. And the, that balance, the right balance is different for everybody. So the most important thing is that you live your life in a way that you're trying to stick to the, the balance that makes the most sense for you. And so to the extent that you live your life in the balance according to what your uh, core values are, then you're successful. Interesting, that's great. Okay, this one was submitted by uh, Mitty Lieberson. He asked, uh, looking back, are Bob and Paul sorry that they split up when they did? <laughs> Mitty, how are you, my boy? Um, you know what? I, I will answer that, and then I like Paul to answer it because I think we have slightly different uh, different perspectives on it. But um, I, I can say that the thing that I miss most about um, not being with Paul every day is the camaraderie that we have. I really feel like like he's a brother. Uh, I love him dearly and uh, always will. Uh, I think over the years we've probably shared ten thousand meals together, um, and. Um, so I miss I miss that part of it for sure. Uh, there, there's nobody in the world that I trust more than Paul, uh, and uh, I, I miss that very very much. From a business <clears throat> perspective, uh, I think that you know when we started the business, we wanted to make money, um, and I always thought at some point we would sell the business. Um, and actually, we almost sold the business in 2007. And for a variety of reasons, that didn't happen, including the one argument that I lost the ball, thankfully, uh, because we would have sold for a lot less. Um, but um, that deal didn't happen. But what occurred to us by that going down that road in 2007 was that if we ever sold the company, <clears throat> excuse me, we'd be on five-year contracts with whoever we sold the business to. So in, um, in February, February 19th of 2015, Paul would be turning uh, 55. And so in 2007, we said, you know what? In 2014, we should think about selling the business because the five-year contracts will probably be perceived to have more value if we're in our 50s for those five years than if we're in our 60s or 70s or 80s. Um, so we should really, unless the market is really in the tank in 2014, we should think about selling in 2014. So we get to 2014, things are very robust. Little did we know that that would be the year in which uh, more buildings would sell in, in New York City, 5,534 buildings sold in 2014, which was an all time record by more than 10%. So from a timing perspective, only, only retrospectively, we sold at the absolute perfect time that we could have. Um, but that was just luck. That's part of it. I said, yeah, you had to work hard and you have to be lucky. We were very, very lucky. So from that perspective, the, the sale of the business uh, changed my life personally. So I'm, I'm very happy that we did it when we did. Uh, but I, I miss, the, uh, miss the people. Uh, I miss seeing James every day, miss seeing Paul every day, all of our other partners. But um, it was the right move, I think, uh, for me personally. Um, uh, based on how lucky the timing was. But I'd like Paul to answer that because I think he has a different, slightly different perspective on it. Yeah, I, um, I definitely miss the whole crew, especially Bob and James and uh, really the whole team. Um, I think one of the healthy things about us was, you're absolutely right, Bob, we started from the same place. We wanted to get to the same place. One of the super healthy things about our relationship was that we uh, became the yin and yang after a while. 
I love certain aspects of the day-to-day management. Um, Bob was a superstar salesperson. So we kind of each freed ourselves up to do the things that we love to do. So the way I'm looking at it now is damn right. Um, thanks for asking the hard question, Mitty. I, I love you. Um, but um, I think we're both really happy now. And Agreed. is there anything the both of you would have done differently back at Massey Mackel? No, I a couple of things in retrospect, and that's that's a great question, Ryan. I, I think that, um, as I said, we would have started delegating sooner, um, maybe taken a few more chances. One of the things that really helped propel the business was um, after 9-11, um, many companies were laying people off. <clears throat> Um, and there were a lot of really highly qualified people that were, were out of jobs. Uh, and we went out at the time, um, September 11th of 01, we had 21 people. Paul and I were still at that time interviewing everybody. We went out and hired a director of HR. And a year and a half later, we had 120 people at the company because we were confident that New York City would bounce back, that it was time to grow. So that, that delegating that responsibility to a director of HR was great. Uh, I would have gotten into the debt business sooner than we did. Our debt business really took off. We started the debt business, Paul, in 11 or 12. Right. right? Um, uh, and that was a great business, so synergistic with uh, investment sales. I wish we had started that business sooner. Um, and. Uh, the only other regret was that I lost the coin flip in the in the lobby <laughs> of the Waldorf, and it wasn't Knackle Massey instead of Massey Knackle. And I kept telling him, "Can you imagine people trying to find that name in the in the uh, in the telephone book?" Which is how we looked it up at the time. I I think we were cliche uh, for the first ten years, and that every year we said to each other, "Let's grow the business," and we went back to work. We were like every business school story you've you heard about the baker in the bake shop, working in the bake shop, not on the bake shop. Stopping and planning is critical. Um, we almost sold the business the first time uh, to another national company out of frustration in 2000. Remember, Bob? Yeah, and absolutely. That, that was all about the fact that the business was not growing um, and not until that that transaction went south and we were relieved um they were good guys but we we just realized we were gonna you know we were gonna give up our dreams um that we got off our our tails and started doing things hiring a recruiting director and if you're going to recruit on scale you need a training director and that was 2000 to 2007 and every time we did something it got better but but it, it's not human nature I think in most cases to do as much planning as you uh, need to do. Um, but remember to be working. Um, and this, this applies to every single person, whether you're running a team or you're, or just your life or a division of a company, um, make the time to plan. Yeah. And I think, you know, thinking back, you, you reminded me, I haven't thought about that in a while, but in 2000, when we were talking to this national company about selling to them, uh, we were asking 6 million, they were offering five million. Uh, they wouldn't come up. We wouldn't come down. And the excuse they used for not willing to come up is they said, "Look, we're making 25, 30 percent on our internet stock investments." Uh, and a year later, the dot com bubble <laughs> burst, and we had uh, implemented so many of these growth strategies. We went through a period of long period of time where we had no interest in selling at all. So thankfully, th thankfully, the dot com bubble didn't burst sooner, or uh, we might have made a big mistake. Bob and Paul, I have a question. Um, how about today, uh, given your thoughts on planning? If you were to plan today, what, what would your plan be, and where do you see opportunities in the New York market for both brokers and for buyers? Uh, Paul, you want to take that since you're you're planning for a company. I'm just planning for a small team. <laughs> yeah, we um. We see the uh, the world, so Bob mentioned the fact that we got into the debt and equity placement business later in the uh, history of MK. Uh, we think that's the way forward now. I think Bob probably agrees with that, that 
Um, if you have a, a partnership um, uh, between sales brokers and debt brokers, it's, it's strategic and it, it's, uh, it, it's powerful. And I think um, there are some strong competitors in both the sales market uh, and the debt and equity market, but there's so much business out there. I mean, there are, you know, 27, 2,800 uh, building sales in a normal year, um, but people only sell a building once every 39 years statistically. And um, so what they more typically do is refi every four or five. So there's 12,000 loans in the five boroughs every year, uh, which is about on an annual basis, $130 billion of consideration. So that's a really big business. So uh, I think that's what we and a lot of our competitors are realizing now and um, look forward to, to gobbling up some market share in that world. Yeah, for me, it's, it's all about uh, building relationships and continuing to enhance relationships. You know, I don't think, I think that around the, the margins, a broker can try to manufacture business, uh, for, but for the most part, that's very challenging. Uh, so try to put yourself in a position where when the volume does come back uh, and the market is robust again, that you're in a position to take advantage of it. The one good thing about downturns is that probably a year from now, there'll be 20 or 30% fewer brokers than there were two months ago. Uh, so there'll be less competition out there, uh, but you want to put yourself in a position to take advantage of a, as much of that business as possible. And our business is a relationship business, so you know, focus on those relationships. Can you? We have a question. Can you talk about your favorite or most memorable deal that you worked on? Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll tell you a great story. This is this is. Uh, and typical apropos of my career, it's, it's a seven and a half million dollar deal. Um, but uh, it's a, a sale of the Gotham Book Mart at 41 West 47th Street. Uh, a guy named Andy Brown owned it. It was one of the few non-jewelry buildings on the block. And Andy knew that he was going to sell the building 10 years before he did. He owned the building in a C Corp. He converted it to an S Corp, had to wait 10 years to take advantage of the favorable tax treatment. And he was telling everybody for 10 years, yeah, I'm going to sell the building in 10 years. Um, everybody knew he was going to be selling. Um, I, he was one of the guys that owned my territory, so I called him all the time. Uh, I get him to hire me. And the, the approaches that we got from so many different people, mostly in the jewelry industry, uh, were crazy. Like I would have somebody come up to me and say, Bob, you know, uh, I'll, I'll give you, uh, you know, 50,000 in cash if you can get this building for me. And I go to Andy, I say, hey, Andy, you know what? Mr. X just offered me 50,000 in cash. He's, oh yeah, he's been trying to buy the building. He's offered me 2 million in cash in addition to what he'd pay on the books for the building. And I have another guy offer me a gold bar Another guy offered me a diamond, and each time I would I would go to Andy and say, hey, Andy, this guy offered me gold, this guy offered me a diamond, and he'd say, oh, yeah, yeah, that guy, he offered me the same, and it was, it was really wild, and so many people were trying to figure out, everybody on the block wanted to buy the building, um, and it was, it was interesting how um, everybody kind of knew what was going on. We think that people around town or in the jewelry industry were paying one of the employees of the bookshop to tell them what the bids were because everybody seemed to know what everybody else was bidding. Um, and so the, we had a, a bid deadline and the day of the bid deadline, Andy Brown is at Burger's Deli across the street from his building having lunch. And the cashier at the deli told him, oh, Mr. Brown, I understand you have your bid deadline today. I hear that five and a half million is going to be your top bid. Like, what? So actually, we have the bid deadline, two bids, five and a half million. So I'm like, Andy, this, this something is not, not right here. We have to 
not have people, I'm not gonna send you any faxes anymore. This is before email was really prevalent. I'm not gonna send you faxes. Somebody's taking my faxes off the machine. Something's not right. So we devised a system where we went back to all the bidders and said, you know what? You were not the top bid because nobody was the top bid. We had two bids that were tied, so it wasn't a lie. Uh, and I told Andy, I said, tell your attorney to draft a contract for uh, whoever we're going to sell to. And so I told everybody, you weren't the top bid and, um, and we're drafting a contract for someone, which we were, not lies. And I told Andy, I said, Andy, let's just not go back to anybody for a couple of weeks and see what happens. And everybody wanted to know what was going on. So after a few days, you get a call, hey, what's going on? Oh, we're drafting a contract. You know, people were calling Andy, people calling me. Then, you know, one of the bidders who was at 5.2 said, hey, what if I offered 5.8? What would happen? Could I get the building if I offered 5.8? I don't know. Let me, let me see. Let me talk to the owner. Another guy calls, hey, what if I offered 6 million? Could that get me? And this went on for about a month, and we ended up selling the building to the neighbor for 7.5 million bucks. And uh, I think that was my favorite because, number one, Andy was a really, really nice guy. This money was going to provide for his retirement. Um, it was, there were so many different people coming at it from all different angles. There was this whole intrigue about how it, does the whole market know what everybody's bidding. Uh, and to get that one done was a, uh, a really, really fun one to work on. Good Paul, trusting. you want to talk about yours? Trusting your gut on that one. You know, I would say mine is a little different. Um, I, my point of pride is more, um, in having had a hand in a, a whole bunch of different careers. I think Bob's had that same hand, um, you know, with James Nelson and with Rob Shapiro and, and a couple of other people who are here today. But um, I think everyone makes their own career, but I think we had a hand in a whole bunch of great careers. And that's, a, that's my huge takeaway from our whole experience together. Yep, absolutely. I, I second that. It's uh, great to see we had a number of spin-off companies that have spun out of uh, what was MK, and um, you know we uh, we're rooting for those guys, hoping to have, hoping to see them do well. That's great. We also got yeah, that's great. We also got a, another question regarding whether you think major brokerage firms will eventually dominate and take over the middle market. No way. <laughs> <laughs> now you know what I, I think that yes there is clearly a consolidation trend but i think there's there's always a space for niche players um and i think that is again because of specialization uh and being able to differentiate yourself so i don't ever see a time when there's there are two or three giant companies and and no one else there's there's always room always room for uh for different players in the market hey bob and paul a question for you i'm curious does the psychology of the current environment seem similar to what you felt in the past or you know does it seem more acute right now kind of in terms of crises and so forth yeah i'd say from from my perspective i think one interesting observation is that uh, you know as as horrible as 9-11 was, uh, it was an event. Um, about 3,000 people died, unfortunately. Uh, now I think in New York City, we're approaching or have just passed 20,000. Um, so I think that uh, today, it's more likely that, that we know someone who has passed away either directly or tangentially. And I think that the psych psychological impact of this is significantly more than we saw in 9-11. Um, after 9-11, we did have a few clients that sold their properties and moved out of town. Um, but it was really a very, very thin slice of the market. Uh, today, there are many people who, because they've been contemplating mortality, 
Uh, and how could you not when you either know some people, a lot of people that have passed away, you go outside, you have to put a mask on, you were constantly reminded of it. And so I think there are a lot of people who may make real estate moves based on lifestyle decisions, not necessarily economic decisions. And so I think we could see some trading as people reallocate portfolios uh, to either own in a more uh, geographically diversified way, or they decide, you know what, I have all of my <laughs> net worth in equity and real estate. I'm going to put a bunch of millions in the bank. I don't care if I get zero on it. I want to know that the money is there and it's available to me. I think that the contemplation of mortality is going to make some market participants do things based on wanting to have a lifestyle or a comfort level that is not necessarily based on economics. And then I think we have time for two last questions. We actually got one in from Rob Shapiro who was wondering how far you think retail rents will drop in high rent districts. And then after that, the last question from Lindsay Ornstein, um, she was wondering if you think there's a time in the future when the band will all get back together. <laughs> um, well, uh, both, of those, Chappie, both of those questions go to Bob. <laughs> yeah, I'll, uh, the first one is easy to answer, Shappy. I won't answer it. Um, and this is, Lots of schools have thought about what's going to happen with retail, and uh, you know, I don't, I, I don't want to uh, to depress everybody, but uh, you know, we'll see. It's TBD. We have to see how the the reengagement with the economy goes. Uh, the that reengagement is clearly going to be very, very incremental, and um, it, depending on how that plays out, we'll see. I think you'll see in retail going to see much more of a trend towards percentage leases uh, as opposed to um, leases where rent payments are set in stone, um, you know, mainly because of the uncertainty surrounding everything. Um, and will the band ever get back together? Uh, in our hearts, we're always together. So, uh, you know, we, uh, we occasionally plan social en engagements, but you know, it's gonna. We'll see when we can get together physically again. But uh, spiritually, the band is is always together and always will be. Agreed with that. The uh, the band is family. Aww. this has been great. I've really enjoyed listening to the to both of you speak, and it's been a nice escape. It was, from it was, the world. It was really nice for me. I didn't have to prepare. <laughs> <laughs> The comments were great, and uh, now we can all uh, go forward in our careers and feel a little more inspired. And uh, thank you both for doing this, and thanks to the board. This is great. Thank you. Yeah, and leave you with one thought. You know, have faith. Have faith. Have courage. Do the right thing. Work hard. Focus on the relationships. And you know what? If you if you do those things, everything's going to work out great for you. I wish you all the best of luck, and please stay stay safe and healthy, and uh, go get them. Thanks, Bob.